than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and Okay, so uh, today's lecture, well, administrative stuff again. So uh, hopefully everyone has finished uh, project three. Uh, if you haven't, it's already past due. So yeah, you will either be uh, using your grace days or there could be penalty. Right? So hopefully everyone has finished uh, the third project. And then uh, this are uh, actually the last two assignments uh, for this semester, right? Homework five will be released um, uh, next Monday, November the 2nd, and will be due on um, December the 2nd. And the last project will be project four. It will actually be released today, and it will be due on uh, December the 5th, right? Before the final exam. <laughs> so also, uh, these uh, database talks are coming to the end of the semester. Again, today we have this uh, Flurry uh, coming to talk about their uh, cloud native ledger or like blockchain uh, graph database system, right? So like lots of uh, buzzwords there. All right. So <laughs> today's lecture and then the next two lectures would actually be the uh, last high level topic uh, of this course, right? It is fast, right? So uh, today and the uh, next two classes, we'll be talking about a uh, distributed database system, all right? So uh, I don't know whether Andrew has mentioned this before, but in previous years, uh, we have we probably have discussed the concept of a parallel database uh, when we talk about uh, query execution earlier in the semester. <laughs> so there's actually a difference here, right? So when we talk about parallel databases, we may also uh, partition the database um, into uh, different portions and uh, different parts of the system are responsible for different things. But we sort of assume that uh, those uh, nodes uh, in a parallel database actually close uh, to each other. And then there's a really fast connection that would uh, uh, co uh, coordinate and or connect those different nodes, and those nodes go together, right? It's like a one node, if it's one node is down, then the entire database is down, right? There's no uh, fail over kind of stuff. Uh, and then we also assume the communication cost is small, right? But today's lecture, we're going to talk about uh, this kind of distributed database, where we actually uh, can arrange different nodes that either uh, in the same machine or could potentially be very, very far away from each other, right? For example, uh, in a distributed database, the nodes or the partitions of data could come from different regions on different even continents, right, in a, in, a, in a cloud, for example. And then, I mean, they would uh, communicate with each other, communicate with each other uh, using the uh, public network, which means that the network latency uh, could be really high. And then uh, different nodes can uh, actually fail, right? So in a di distributed database setting, if one node is down, we also need to have a mechanism for the whole system to be running. Well, like handle the case where one node failure and then we spin up another node to replace that node, et cetera, right? And again, the communication uh, cost can be high, and then there could be problems of a node failure that we are going to handle in a distributed setting. But you can see that uh, the distributed database would actually be a much more powerful, right? You can uh, distribute or even replicate your uh, data across different locations, different data centers, or even different continents, right? So if one data center is down, you have an another data center, it's still up, and then your database system, I mean, hopefully uh, you have a mechanism to let the database system still be running so the system can have much more availability, right? and then give you much more flexibility on uh, to where to partition your data as well. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, one thing to note here is that for all the topics we have uh, so far talked about in this class, I mean, all of those things, would, we will still be using them uh, in a distributed database system setting, right? For example, in a distributed database, we will still be doing query organization and planning, we will still be doing currency control, we will, and we will still be doing login recovery, et cetera. But the only thing is that most of those things will actually become harder, if not a lot harder, right? <laughs> so for example, if you, want to do in, if you want to do a concurrency control, well, then you not only need to handle the case where a different part of the data may uh, be on different machines that are potentially be far away, I mean, very high uh, communication cost, and also while transactions are executing, when you lock some data, then that node may go down, right? Then essentially uh, your lock would actually never be released if you don't uh, have a mechanism to handle that or resume uh, or like spawn up another node to replace that node, et cetera, right? So we are still be doing uh, uh, most of these things or, or all of those things, it's just uh, there will be uh, much more challenges in a distributed environment, all right? So today's agenda will actually be uh, talking about uh, some of the fund fund foundations or like basic concepts uh, in a distributed database uh, scenario, right? So for the uh, uh, class on Wednesday as well as uh, next Monday, we'll more talk about 
specific algorithm, right? Like more implementation details. Uh, but today we are going to, because I mean the, 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 the whole topic of, of this review dev is could actually very well be its own like CMS turn long course, right? So today we are just only going to kind of scratch the surface and talk about some high level uh, mental model as well as intuitions. And then the next uh, two classes will go into a little bit more details, right? So specifically, we are going to talk about what will be the high level architecture that uh, we can choose when we're trying to build a distributed database, and then what about the uh, related uh, design issues? And then we'll also talk about uh, some methods to partition your data right, across these different nodes or machines. And then lastly, we'll, give, we'll talk a little bit about distributed concurrency control, and we'll get more about that next Monday. All right, that's today's content. <laughs> so first of all, uh, the system architecture, especially uh, when we say uh, uh, distributed database, right? We, we, we refer to the architecture of a distributed database as the mechanism that the system is going to uh, allow uh, or specify what resources uh, can the CPU directly access, right? So, I mean, every system has an architecture, right? But in distributed database, the architecture of a distributed database is, database is specifically referring to uh, how system allow the CPU to directly access different type of resources, say whether the system uh, allows the CPU to directly access the data on the disk. Well, if the disk is on a single machine, then the, the system can allow it to access, but it could choose also choose not to allow. And then if the disk is on a different machine, then obviously, I mean, the, the CPU cannot directly access that data on, a, on the disk on a different machine, right? So this kind of like, a, this kind of uh, decisions would be uh, called the architecture choices of a distributed database. Uh, and then this actually, this choice of architecture would very well affecting uh, many other implementation details and algorithms that we choose to implement a distributed database. All right, so uh, this sounds a little bit uh, abstract. Let me give you some specific examples. <laughs> Uh, so the first type of distributed architecture, first type of distributed database architecture, I right, need to be specific here, will be called shared everything. So this will actually be exactly the same as the single node database that we talked about so far in the semester. Essentially, I mean, everything is on the same machine and the CPU can directly access both the memory and disk on the same machine, right? So, I mean, it's like a shared everything and then it's the same as a single node database. That all, that's the architecture, the, the, the single node database system would be using uh, if we consider the terminology of a distributed database system architecture. All right. So now we got to uh, we got to the scenario where uh, the resources or CPUs can be on different machines, right? So the first architecture choice of distributed database would be called shared memory. So in this architecture, again, as this illustri illustrated here. These CPUs can be on different machines, right? I mean, can be very, very far away from each other. But then we are going to assume that there's a central mechanism or unified channel that allows these CPUs to access memories, like a central place of a big chunk of memory, either on a single machine or on different machines, right? So this mechanism could be, um, uh, for example, RDMA or InfiniBand, but the, the high level idea is that this, uh, these CPUs don't really know which memory chip is on which machine is like local to the CPU or not, right? It always goes through this uh, unified interface that would hide the details of the memory. And this interface would deal with uh, the uh, memory uh, consistency or coherency uh, for this big chunk of memories, either I mean, on a single location or memory distributed on uh, different places. And then the, each memory would, would have access to the local disk, uh, I mean, attached to it, all right? So that's called shared memory. Make sense? So the next architecture, which is actually a little bit more uncommon, will be called shared disk, right? So kind of just uh, uh, move this uh, central interface that coordinate the different system fr from between CPU and the memory to between memory and disk, right? So in this shared disk architecture, again, Different CPU chips could be on different machines, different nodes, and the every CPU would have local access to its own uh, memory, right? But then below this memory, there's a central, again, centralized interface or unified channel that would allow this memory to uh, read data from uh, this like a shared big chunk of uh, disk space, right? Either this, this disk 
could be on a single machine again, or could be distri distributed on different machines, doesn't matter. But the important thing is that when any time a CPU wants to read some data, it first go to its local memory, and then the local memory would actually go through this unified interface to get data from a shared pool of disk space. All right, make sense? So this is actually, think of this, this is, we'll get to the details, but this is actually uh, much more common these days, and especially in the cloud area, right? This shared disk could be something like S3 on Amazon, for example, right? So you can have a different compute node, but then at the end of the day, they all go through this Amazon S3 service to get the data, regardless of which machine exactly the data is, right? And then the Lux architecture would be called shared nothing. It's actually also kind of common, but more common before 2010s, before the cloud time. So essentially in this architecture, I mean the CPU had, every CPU would have uh, its own memory and disk directly attached to the local machine, right? So every time the CPU wants to read data, go to its local memory, then go to its local disk. But then any, any time, one machine or one CPU needs to access data on a different disk, they actually need to go to a higher level uh, network protocol. Sometimes it just would be a public network, right? They would go to this higher level network communication channel to coordinate uh, the data reside on uh, different machines and, and different disks, etc. But the important thing is that every CPU has its own uh, memory and a disk, and there's no resource sharing uh, below CPU. All right, make sense? Cool. <laughs> so uh, let's give you um, some uh, more specific about these uh, different architectures. So the first, I mean, uh, well, the very first would be uh, shared everything, but that's kind of there's a single node architecture that, were, that we already talked about, right? So in the uh, distributed setting, the first architecture I mentioned would be a shared memory, and again, I mean, these CPUs would actually have a uh, have access to this common memory address space via a first uh, interconnect. And oftentimes this could be implemented with RDMA, right? Remote uh, direct memory access. Or just by, by the name, you can tell that that's kind of like an interface that would allow uh, different CPUs directly access memory reside on different machines. And then, like I mentioned here, uh, every processor would actually have a global view of the entire memory, right? So no matter where the memory chip resides, every CPU will know what will be the content that the database system has on each location of this I mean, entire memory space, and then can put the data or can either read data or write data on any location in the entire memory address space, okay? Uh, and then, yeah, then uh, the, the, all the coordination would be happen in this uh, network layer. And then the, this network layer or the centralized interface will be handling uh, all the cache coherency and consistency, et cetera. Um, but one thing to note here is that actually uh, in practice, almost no database system would uh, implement a distributed architecture this way. And the, 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 the main reason would be just that um, in order to coordinate the cache coherency as well as the cache consistency with this uh, single network uh, interface, it's actually uh, pretty uh, difficult and the overhead is, is often high. Right, it's like a, it's much easier to deal with the, the uh, issue on, onto the uh, lower layer, or even just use a shared nothing architecture. Right, so in practice, almost nobody used that. So what would be more common uh, use case of this idea? Right, not necessarily in the database area, but a common, more common use case of this idea would actually be a high performance computing. Right, because in, in in that world, you often have this like a giant machine. Right, with lots of lots of CPUs, and also a centralized location with a giant, I mean, a chunk of memory, like terabytes, etc. So uh, in that uh, in that world, then it's actually a common to have this uh, shared memory address of this like entire big I mean, array of memory in your data center, and then uh, using MPI to coordinate uh, the uh, communication between different compute nodes. Right, so it's actually a more common. This idea is more commonly used in the HPC world uh, rather than the distributed database system world. All right. So next idea would be a shared disk. <laughs> Again, like I mentioned, this is actually a very very common uh, these days, especially in the uh, area of cloud. And then the the the, the, the high level idea would just be that um, each each uh, CPU would have local access to the memory, uh, doing all the computation and then uh, do the read write memory read and write there or in the read and write in the buffer pool, in other words. But then, when they need data, they would actually go to this uh, centralized location with a unified channel, right? And then to, uh, I mean, to store 
uh, data there. So this is actually more common, especially in the cloud era, because this have this uh, appealing uh, property where it can allow you to scale the uh, storage and compute independently, right? independently, right? So because in this architecture, this, um, this all the uh, data access is going through this centralized interface and all the details of how many disks are there, what the locations of all those disks, uh, et cetera, will actually be hidden, right? So if your storage is not enough, you can add more disk space, I mean, below this network uh, interface, then this compute node doesn't need to know, right? Similarly, if you realize that you don't have enough compute capacity, but you have already have enough disk, then you can simply add more compute node. And then that doesn't affect uh, your operation on the disk, almost doesn't affect your operation on disk. Right? Even in some cases, you still need to handle, handle a few corner cases. So uh, this is actually a very appealing property, especially in the cloud era, people want this um, convenience and flexibility to de deploy their application applications and scale resource, resources up and down in the cloud, right? So uh, having this shared disk architecture would be uh, very well uh, compatible with that goal, right? So another thing to mention here is that even though uh, we have this separation between uh, memory and disk and all the data access going through this uh, network layer, but while we, the database system are executing queries, especially executing transactions, right? There would also need to be direct messages uh, sent between this uh, computer node or between this uh, CPU and memory. And we'll, we'll know more details later, but essentially if you uh, want to do uh, things like a concurrency control, for example, then you still need to do a little bit of coordination, even though uh, you read all the data from this centralized location. Okay, so again, this is like just examples of the system uh, that would be uh, using this architecture. architecture. Uh, most of the systems are after 2010 would actually, or most of the distributed database systems after 2010, especially a system in the cloud, uh, would actually uh, prefer this architecture, all right? So we'll give you a specific example here, right? <laughs> Say uh, I have uh, one uh, distributed database with a two uh, compute node, right? That would uh, include the uh, memory chip as, as the uh, CPU processor. And then we have this centralized location to have uh, all your data, right? Think of the centralized location, for example, as the uh, Amazon S3, uh, I mean, data interface, data storage interface, right? And then for this node, think of them as Amazon EC2 instance, for example, right? Then uh, in this case, say uh, the application server wants to uh, get data with ID uh, 101, then what this node or computer node with this um, processor as well as the memory would do that, it would just go through uh, this unified interface for all the storage to find out which would be page uh, that contains the ID, uh, with contains, contains record with ID 101, and then read the data and or put the, that specific page to the buffer pool in this uh, node, node up above, right? I mean, similarly, if you have another uh, another uh, transactions, oh, sorry, another query wants to read um, I tuple with ID 200, and then uh, this node will go to, through this interface, find that uh, page on this shared uh, disk space, and then get that page back into the buffer pool and read that out, all right? So again, with this, you can easily uh, scale the compute and, uh, and, and uh, storage independently, right? So say here, for example, I want a, uh, I realize that I don't have enough compute capacity, right? I want to add a new compute node. Then that's very easy, right? You don't need to do, uh, mostly you don't need to deal with anything in the storage space. You just add another compute node with additional uh, CPU as well as memory. And then say now you want to, you still want to get a ID record with ID 100, then you can just uh, go to um, its disk and get that page back, all right? So uh, what would be a little bit Tricky here is that, see, at some point you want to update uh, this ad, uh, page or this ID, uh, sorry, you want to update this record or tuple with ID 101, right? Then you could do that, right? You could go through uh, this uh, computer node and then eventually get to the storage layer uh, and then update that page. But the problem is that, like I mentioned earlier, other nodes in the system, for example, here, right? Other, node, other nodes in the system may have read this uh, tuple from that page as well, right? And then have some uh, local copy, I mean, in the, of this page in the in buffer pool that it operates on either read and write, right? So in this case, if there's an update in this compute node, right, also update this record, then there's, like I mentioned earlier, between these uh, compute nodes, even though it's a shared disk architecture, 
there would still be a message passing between this compute node that you need to coordinate, hey, uh, which node has which copy of uh, which page or which record, and then when an update happen, how do we need to handle the uh, concurrency between them, et cetera, right? Well, this is just a high level idea to tell you that um, there still need to be a coordination between the different compute nodes, and we'll, we'll talk about the detailed concurrency control algorithms later, all right? But this is this illustration of a shared disk uh, distributed database system architecture makes sense. Okay. So uh, similarly, right, you, uh, uh, this is just the same as you can uh, uh, scale this uh, compute node, right, add a new uh, node with a CPU and memory. I mean, you can also add, I mean, storage node uh, below this uh, shared disk layer, right? And then again, I mean, you don't necessarily need to touch most of the stuff in the compute layer because this is always, is all this storage will be hidden behind this and unified interface of this shared disk networking layer, all right? Those are very easy to scale resources up and down, especially independently. So uh, the last architecture, uh, last architecture would be a shared nothing architecture, right? So uh, again, like I mentioned before, every uh, instance in this, or every node in this architecture will just have its own uh, CPU, memory, and disk. And then it will always access the data locally, right? Either memory or disk. And then when a specific node needs to access data on a different machine, it will actually go to this uh, higher level network layer. In, in many cases, it will just be a public network uh, to get the data uh, remotely, right? <laughs> so uh, there are actually, um, well, the immediate, uh, the obviously the advantage of this approach is that if a query or a transaction only needs to access data on its local disk, then it will be very fast, right? Because the, the, each every CPU would have a local memory and disk attached to it, and then if all the data this query or transaction needs to access will be on this local disk, then it can just directly read everything locally, right? It doesn't need to go through the uh, expensive network uh, protocol, right? So that's the obvious advantage for that. But then there are also a corresponding disadvantage, right? The first would be that unlike a shared disk architecture, it's difficult to uh, scale uh, uh, compute and storage independently, right? Because every node would have a storage and a compute and a memory attached to it. And also, it's also a little bit more difficult to ensure the uh, consistency of data correctness in this shared disk, oh, sorry, in this shared nothing architecture, because now every uh, node would have its own partition of the data, right? There's no centralized location of storage anymore. Every node would have its own partition of data, and every time one node, for example, update a record, then if other nodes need to read the record, you sort of need to coordinate not only between a different competition, but also you need to coordinate the data between different nodes as well in this shared nothing architecture. Especially, I mean, when you want to replicate a portion of the data on multiple nodes for availability reason, right? So could be a little bit uh, that challenges as well. But again, um, because of its uh, efficiency and performance reason, many of the systems, uh, especially systems before 2010, would actually uh, use uh, this architecture. So this is also a very commonly used in uh, distributed database systems. All right? Any questions about the shared nothing architecture? Okay. So we'll just give you an example here, right? <laughs> so in this shared nothing architecture, uh, every node, again, would have a memory, CPU, as well as uh, storage. And then, for example, here, let's say we have two nodes. The first node, as I illustrated here, would, or in other words, we can call it a partition, right? It would have the partition of the data from ID uh, 1 to 150. And the second node, for example, could have the partition of the data from ID 151 to 300, right? And for example, in this case, if uh, the uh, application server sends a query that wants to access the tuple with ID 200, and then this query would just be uh, sent to this second partition. Right? Uh, of course, there actually needs to be some sort of a mechanism to figure out which query this actually, which partition or which node should the application server send this query to, right? We, we are ignoring that for now, but we'll get to that later in this class. But, but again, as illustration, this query uh, will go to this uh, second partition or second node. And then uh, similarly, uh, oh, in another example, right, say you now another query wants to access two records or two tuples, right? The first with ID 10, the second with ID 100. Then for the uh, tuple or record with ID 10, it actually directly access it from this local disk, right? Because it's just on the first partition. Then for the second request, right, 
when this query, if this query needs to access a tuple with ID 200, then 200 is not on the first partition that handles uh, this query, right? So what typically would happen is that there would be a coordination between different partitions. So one common approach would be that um, this first node would send a request to the second node and say that, hey, I have a query that needs to access um, tuple or the content of the tuple with ID 200, and then it sends that to the second node, second node read that uh, record, and then get that back to the first node. Uh, so there will be, needs to be coordination uh, happening there in this uh, share nothing architecture, all right? So <laughs> here, say that uh, I want to uh, scale the resources up and down, then unlike this uh, share this architecture, I can either only uh, add more compute node or storage node. Here I have to add, a, add everything, right? So like every node would have a memory, storage, and a compute in it. But, but then one issue that is, we have to deal with here is that, I mean, if, if we just, uh, I mean, create a new node with this like empty uh, disk space, then it's kind of like a waste, right? So if we still have um, this uh, data from ID 1 to 150 on the first node, 151 to 300 at the third node, then there will be waste disk space on the second node, right? So typically uh, what, what we, we need to do in a shared nothing distributed, distributed database architecture, architecture is that every time when we add a new node, we also need to redistribute the data. So move some of the data from the other node to this new node so that uh, this new node also would handle some of the workload instead of wasting this compute and storage here, right? So for example here, what we can do is that we can move 50 record from the first node and 50 record from the third node and get to the uh, get to the uh, middle node, right? But I mean here, I mean the, the, the illustration may seem simple, right? If you just I mean we, I just change the number and I have a few arrows here, but then in actuality, this data movement actually can be very expensive and complex because essentially it's, it's a it's a giant transaction that you need to move one big part of data from delete, one big part of data from some node or, or like a few nodes of, 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 a data, of, of your entire uh, distributed system. And then after the deletion, you need to in ensure that every single record is correctly inserted into a, I mean, a, into a new node, right? And then while this is happening, you also need to ensure that the database system are also handling the other transactions or queries executing at the same time, either reading or updating this record correctly, right? So this, this data movement is actually uh, pretty expensive and complex. And then uh, there's also a limit the uh, flexibility of the system. All right, any questions so far about these high level architectures? Okay. So let's talk about a, a few uh, specific, especially a specific design issues that involve when we're trying to uh, build a distributed database. So a little bit of history here, right? <laughs> the uh, very, I mean, like many other concepts in the database system world, I mean, most, uh, the, the distributed system is, is not obviously not a new concept either, right? So the uh, very first few uh, implementation of distributed CSI database system could date back to uh, 1979. And there are actually uh, two uh, kind of like uh, well-known uh, concepts or proof of concept uh, provide, uh, come, came up during that era. The one is called a muffin, that calls some uh, multi-node, like a field, fast uh, ingress, something like that, right? So it came from, uh, it, it came from UC Berkeley, from actually from my advisor's advisor, Michael Stonebreaker. And then there's another kind of, it, it's, it's actually not a real system, more like a proof of concept called SDD1, right? Uh, that uh, came from, uh, it came, also came from 1979, but from this uh, second person called uh, Phil Bernstein, which actually is the uh, inventor of many of the uh, concurrency control algorithms uh, for distributed database system, right? So uh, the, the, he also has a, like, a kind of like a famous um, concept or proof of concept of, distribu of distributed system uh, in that area. But then of course, like, uh, like we mentioned many times uh, in this class, System R has the uh, in original implementation and algorithm for many of the uh, cu current implementations and design of database system today. Here, similarly, System R uh, in 1984 also has a different version or like a new version of the system called System R star have this uh, distributed database system, system uh, capability, right? 
And then there are also another uh, academic version of the GPI system uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, University of Wisconsin. It's called Gamma. That's mostly uh, led by a famous professor there uh, called David DeWitt. Uh, by the way, uh, for in system R, many of the uh, distributed heavy system work was also uh, led by this person called Mohan, right, which would be the author of the Aries paper that we talked about last class. And lastly, uh, the uh, Turing Award winner, right, Jim Gray, he also was like very uh, involved in the development of an early uh, distributed database system called non-stop CPQ, and it uh, came from a company called Tandem. I think right now Tandem is already uh, through multiple acquisitions. Right now Tandem belongs to uh, HP, but he also has a version of a distributed database system that is actually still running today, right? This non-stop CQ, I mean, invented by this tandem company. Right now, of course, there's not, not, not really new features added to non-stop CQ, uh, but the system uh, is actually still used by some applications today, but mostly in maintenance mode already, all right? So that's the uh, history of many of the uh, early implementations of uh, distributed databases. So uh, for today's class, right, we are going to uh, talk about, now we are going to talk about a few design issues when we want to build a distributed database. So uh, at high level, right, we are going to talk, first talk about uh, three uh, questions. The first would be uh, how the applications, where, how does the application find the data, right? Where, how does the application know which node or which partition the data is on? And then how do the, uh, do the uh, queries execute if it finds that the data it needs to access is not on the same machine, right? either a shared nothing or a shared disk, how does the a query going to get the data remotely? And lastly, I mean, how does the database system is going to ensure that when executing queries, especially transactions across different machines, to ensure the correctness of the data, right? And then also beyond these uh, basic, uh, not like beyond these specific topics, one central theme we have to deal with in distributed database system world is that, I mean, nodes can have failure, right? So beyond this specific uh, issue here, we also need to keep in mind that when a failure happens, one node uh, goes down, or if we, or, or in, other, in, other, uh, in other cases, we may need to add a node, right? So when node go down, we want to replace node, or we want to add a new node, how do we need to deal with uh, those decisions as well as the uh, execution of the entire system? All right, that's kind of the, the challenges or the uh, scenarios that we have to uh, think about when we're trying to build a distributed database. So, okay, so the uh, first uh, topic I want to discuss is that there could actually be a choice among how you uh, organize or assign roles to different machines uh, in your entire cluster of machines in the distributed database, database system. So at high level, there will be uh, two uh, different choices. The first will be called homogeneous node, which would mean that every node in your I mean, clusters of machines in your distributed database system will actually have the same responsibility, right? So uh, every node will be handle reads, handle writes, handle uh, the transactions, etc. But I mean, every node, when every node goes down, I mean, you can, you can create or spin up a new node, and this would be exactly the same or has the, exactly the same responsibility as other nodes in the system, right? So obviously one advantage of this is that it's easier to uh, provision new node as, as to uh, resolve the scenario from a failure, right? Because like I mentioned, if you add a new node, well, this, this new node from a functionality perspective would be exactly the same as other nodes, right? If one node fail, you create a new node, then, I mean, this new node would exactly be able to take up the responsibility of the node that failed. So in, con in contrary, a different approach would be called heterogeneous node, which means that different nodes in, in your cluster of distributed database system may actually have a different roles, right? For example, some nodes may have a read intensive queries. Some node may, may be able to handle write intensive queries. But for example, if for, for those like write intensive, for the nodes that handle write inten intensive queries, it may even have a faster disk, right? And then some of the nodes may even just be responsible for handle concurrency, concurrency control, et cetera, right? So in this heterogeneous scenario, then the advantage of, is that you can kind of specialize uh, different nodes for different purposes, right? So potentially have a better efficiency of different nodes based on the task it needs to do. But then the obvious uh, problem or challenge of this uh, heterogeneous approach will be that depending on what kind of a responsibility a node is taking, uh, then when a node fails, it may be difficult to uh, 
to recover from that and then create a new node that exactly take over the responsibility, right? If the responsibility that this particular node that failed taking is like a challenge or difficult, right? Uh, and then another thing to note in this second heterogeneous scenario would be that one physical machine may actually be responsible for a different or, or a number of uh, virtual virtual nodes as well, right? For example, one, if one physical machine is very, very powerful, it can be it can be responsible for both read and write. So it can have, there could be two virtual nodes on that physical machine, one responsible for, uh, for example, read, Read only course and the other responsible for write course. I mean, it, it can you can you can assign the task of different nodes uh, to the same machine as well. All right. So let me uh, give you a more specific example with this uh, heterogeneous architecture. So the example here I'm showing you is actually a uh, a NoSQL system, right? Not really a traditional um, a, a traditional relational database system. So this is actually an example from MongoDB. All right, so uh, MongoDB would be a heterogeneous architecture, but by the way, it's actually a shared nothing architecture, right? So this is, this is kind of like orthogonal, right? Whether uh, si uh, you, you design the system to be uh, heterogeneous or homogeneous, the architecture could either be a shared nothing or shared disk, right? So that kind of like a orthogonal design choices. So in this case, as I'm showing you on the right, I mean, the, in the MongoDB architecture, the data and the CPU and as well as the memory would be on these uh, different uh, nodes called shards. I mean, you can think of them as the partitions of the data, all just like a node, as I uh, mentioned in the earlier example, right? Same meaning. So in the MongoDB part end, uh, they call them shards, and then we have uh, four shards or four partitions. But then beyond these shards, they actually have uh, two different type of heterogeneous nodes, right? One type would be called router node, the other would be called config server node, right? So what would be the responsibility for them? Say that one query is trying to uh, read a tuple with ID 101, then in this MongoDB architecture, all the queries would actually be sent to this specific router nodes first, right? And then the router would be only be responsible to figure out, or to not, not actually to figure out yet, but be responsible to route the queries sent by the application server to the uh, corresponding uh, shards or partitions that would contain that data, all right? But then when the router tries to do that, it actually needs to consolidate the locations of different records, different data with a centralized uh, config server, right? So the config server would have had the information or the state about which record or which page will be on which partition, and the router would be uh, all go to this uh, config server, right? Read this state table from a config server, say that we have four partitions and different I mean, tuples on different partitions. And then after config server figure it out, it will send this uh, information about which uh, partition or shard the router should route this query to, I mean, back to those routers. And finally, I mean, route to the correct, uh, correct, correct place, right? So the router is only responsible for directing the location uh, or directing the uh, direction of queries, and the config server would store all the states of the locations of data on which shards, and the shards would finally be, be responsible to read the data and execute the query. Right? So this is like an example of the MongoDB architecture, and different nodes would have a different uh, uh, responsibilities. All right, make sense? Nice. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's the uh, first design decision. And the second design decision, or actually not really be before, before, not exactly, uh, well, yeah, before we talk about the second design decision, a important concept here uh, we want to achieve with distributed database system is that the users of the distributed database system should actually not know where the, 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 the data is physically located, right? I mean, the, the, similar to the, uh, con when we talk about concurrency control, well, yeah, similar to the concept when we talk about concurrency control, where we, we say we want the database system to handle all the scenarios where there's a dirty, dirty rise, some system failure, et cetera, so the users don't need to worry about locking the data and only need to focus on the core logic of the application. Similar here, in a distributed database system scenario, right? We don't really want the users to be worried about, hey, which part of the data is on which machine, or whether the, the data is partitioned in different machines or even replicated on different machines. We don't want the user to worry about any of those things, right? We want to handle all those things for the users automatically, so that when users write a query, user doesn't really need to know, hey, I'm writing this query to a, like a single node database or a distributed database. Right, this, the, the system will actually hide all those uh, implementation details 
from the user, so that the users, again, can conveniently I mean, store and access their data and then focus on the core logic of their application. Right? So uh, one important notion I mean, related to this that, it, that the distributed system need to deal with is that, like I mentioned, it no needs to be able to automatically figure out hey, how to partition your data to different um, machines in the cluster of a distributed uh, database system, as well as automatically figure out how to read and write data from those partitions, all right? So uh, in, uh, in, I mean, when, when I say uh, database partitioning, that's actually a term more often used in, uh, uh, in a traditional like, relational database world. So in the newer, uh, called NoSQL uh, database system, especially uh, with the example of MongoDB, this partitioning would actually be called sharding, right? And this, for some reason, I actually don't know why, but for some reason, that's a term that more often used uh, for NoSQL system, but essentially that's the same thing, right? Sharding, partitioning, uh, is same meaning. And then it's essentially the database system needs to be able to uh, partition the data onto different places, and we need to be uh, able to uh, figure out where to access data and then fetch the data to, from the uh, correct sharding or partitioning uh, appropriately, and then finally aggregate the results and send back uh, to the user, right? So the users, would be, would be similar to the scenario uh, to writing to a query to a single node database system, right? You shouldn't know that the data is distributed, okay? So the uh, first partitioning uh, approach to do this, or we can, we, or we, as I, I wrote here, call a naive, we can call it naive table partitioning, would be that the database system could choose to uh, put all the data related to one specific table on a partition. Right. Just like one machine is responsible for one table, and the other machine could be responsible for the other table. And of course, this would be uh, under the assumption that every machine uh, would have enough disk space that handle all the data from a particular table. Right? If a table is bigger than the maximum of disk space allowed on a machine, then this like, simple approach doesn't work. And a, uh, another uh, thing is that the scenario where this approach works the best would be the scenario where you don't really have a join query across different tables, or you don't have too many join query across different tables, right? As well as uh, if uh, the distribution of this, these queries against I mean, each table are kind of homogeneous or uniform, then uh, this approach would actually uh, probably would work well, right? So I'll give you an example of this, right? Say I have uh, two tables, table one and table two, then with this naive table partitioning approach, right, you could just um, put, for example, table one, all the data onto this first partition, and then uh, table two, uh, all the data on the second partition, right? And then the ideal query for this would be that you, you always only looking uh, at data from a particular table at a time, right? You don't really have uh, too many joint queries. So uh, because of this limitation that uh, this uh, every uh, table must be able to fit the storage space of, of a uh, specific node, as well as uh, this uh, scenario where, I mean, if you have uh, join queries or if you have uh, queries that don't really have a uniform distribution against uh, different tables, I mean, the performance may not be very good. Actually, uh, in practice, most of the system would actually not, as you can imagine, uh, oh, sorry, most of the system would actually not use uh, this naive table partitioning approach. But then uh, there's uh, one system, actually MongoDB, which does allow you uh, to uh, have the option to allow you to choose this, right? And then they have some use case for this scenario. And I think one use case they, uh, they come up with for this functionality is that if the queries are, if, if a workload has many uh, queries that are only appending logs, right, to a specific table, right? So think of this as a matrix or a logging a store, right? Then if there's, uh, well, workload, there are a bunch of queries only appending uh, logs to the end of the one table and then never or rarely read any data out, then you can think of, you can imagine a uh, uh, system where they have a designated uh, sharding or partition for that specific table with a, with a better disk, right, a faster write speed. And then if you only write to the disk and never and rarely read back again, then a faster disk would probably, or at least a disk that is faster on write would probably help you on that scenario, right? And then other transactions or queries can use other nodes in the system and don't really be affected by the write operation here, right? So that could be one example of use case. Okay, <laughs> so what would be a more common approach? Again, probably a suitable for a more general scenario would be called a horizontal partitioning, right? 
So in this case, instead of putting a entire each of the entire table on a specific node, what you will do here is that you are going to split the tuples from every single table across different nodes, right? And then, of course, you want to be a little bit intelligent about how you are going to split this these tuples, right? Uh, for example, you could try to uh, balance the size of the partitions of the table among different partitioning or shardings to be like equal, or you can also try to balance the load of the queries that are going to, uh, I mean, access data against different partitions of a particular tuple to be uh, roughly uniform or balanced, right? And there are many uh, intelligent decisions you can do with this uh, horizontal partitioning. And then the uh, two common approach would be called hash partitioning and then range partitioning, which I'll give some uh, specific examples uh, in, in the next few slides. And then lastly, one thing to note here is that um, when, we, when the database system partition the data horizontally, right, it doesn't necessarily mean that the different uh, partition have to be on different machines. So, I mean, one scenario would be a physical partition, would be a very common in the shared nothing system, where you indeed, actually, for different partition, they are going to be on different machines attached to different local uh, memory uh, uh, compute as well as uh, storage, right? Then, for the, there could be a logical partition as well, right? Typically seen in a scenario where we have a shared disk system, even though you can partition the data right to different portions or, or chunks, but then they could be all the partitions would be reside on this big pool of storage space, right, in a shared disk scenario behind this network. And then they could be on the same machine, they could be on the different machine, depending on how this shared disk architecture or, or this shared disk space is going to manage that. But then what you can do is that for different compute node, right, they can be responsible for um, handling the queries directed to a different shards. But then in this case, this sharding or the partitioning would actually be logical, right? So only like at a logical level, which computer node should be responsible for the queries against which part of data. The data themselves could be on the same node or same physical node or different physical node, it doesn't really matter. All right, make sense? Okay, nice. So, <laughs> Let me give you an example of this uh, horizontal partition, right? Say here I have uh, this uh, table, right, with the four attributes, and the first thing you need to do is that you have to choose a partition key, right? Like for example, here we choose the uh, second attribute of this partitioning key, and then uh, one uh, simple uh, pr strategy, like I mentioned here, would be uh, one simple strategy you can use would be hash partitioning, right? So in this case, you would just uh, I mean, apply a hash function or all of these values. And then, I mean, one simple thing you could do is just to mod the, mod the hash value by the number of partitions or shards that your database system has, right? In this case, we have a four system, and then after a mod the number four, they can, you can have uh, different uh, I mean, assignments of these different partitions, right? As I illustrated here. And then, uh, assuming that you have a query, that have a where clause I and mean, it contains this partition key, right? Then you can just uh, hash the value in this where clause, uh, and then uh, I mean again mod by this like, number of uh, total number of uh, partitions or shards, and then you can locate the uh, corresponding machine, right? So you can that's how you find where the data is in this uh, horizontal partitioning scenario. And of course, as you can probably tell already. In this uh, horizontal partitioning, it's very, very important to choose which your partition key is, right? Because if you have a, a, a sharding or partitioning, uh, I mean, uh, distribution that where many of your queries don't really have an attribute in your where clause contains the sharding key, then what you have to do is that you have to broadcast those queries, right? Don't have this partition key in where clause to all the shards to find out your, where your query is, so where your data is, and that could be potentially expensive, right? So this choice is very, very important, all right? So another uh, challenge uh, we, may, may, we may encounter in this uh, simple, at least a simple hash partitioning scheme is that what if, say right now, again, independent of whether I'm doing share nothing or share disk, right? <laughs> Actually, in this, in this example here, I'm illustrating more a uh, shared disk, uh, sorry, shared nothing scenario. But the one challenge here is that what if I want to add a new machine, right? And then right now, the number of uh, uh, shards or partitions will actually be five. Then in this case, pretty much, I mean, in, most of the values, I mean, after this hash and multiplied by this number of partitions, the partition assignment, most of this assignment will actually change, right? And in this case, unlike this um, simple scenario I mentioned earlier, where you have some, some sort of like a range-based uh, uh, assignment of a different number of records on different machines. Now, 
if you change or if you add this new node and change your uh, equation on assign the shards, then potentially, I mean, lots of things would change. And then you have to uh, move data all around your entire cluster. Right, and then put back uh, this uh, the location, put back the potential of the data to the correct location, and this potentially be a very very expensive and also very very difficult to coordinate as well. Right, so that would be a challenge happening in this case. Again, like I mentioned here, it's it's um, it's in the, but the, the choice of partitioning uh, 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 the, which partitioning algorithm you use will actually be uh, independent of whether you use shared nothing or shared disk. But that said, this uh, problem would actually be uh, bigger when you have a shared nothing uh, architecture, right? Because in shared nothing architecture, every uh, load would have a specific portion of the data attached to it that needs to be responsible for, right? So there will be more of a challenge, more kind of moving around how to deal with in that architecture. In the uh, shared disk architecture, then uh, because everything is managed by this uh, shared disk layer, below the networking layer, things could be a little bit easier. But again, similar problem you still have to deal with. All right? But it potentially the, 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 the mechanism would be a little bit simpler. So the uh, approach we address this problem would actually be a, a very interesting idea, personally, I think, called consistency hashing, right? So uh, some of you may actually have heard of this idea of consistent, uh, consistent hashing in some of your other uh, either uh, distributed system class or other like uh, cloud computing classes, right? It's actually a, a very interesting idea came out from uh, MIT uh, in early 2000s, right? So what it can do is that it will actually uh, allow you to do uh, incremental additions or removals of, of the nodes or machines in your cluster without actually having to uh, move all the data around, right? Destroy the assignments of everything. So the, the, let me just read a high level idea, right? And the idea is that instead of having uh, this um, function that mod the hash value by the number of uh, nodes, what consistent hashing is that it would actually have a, uh, mentally it would have a ring that would uh, map all the hash values too, right? And this ring would be between uh, zero or one, zero to one, right? I mean, let me look at this uh, user ring here. I mean, think about that we have a, a, a ring of values I mean, from the top zero and then uh, clock, yeah, because it's a clockwise and then zero, 0 0.5 at the bottom and to one, right? And then for each partition, it will be actually be responsible for the hash value in a specific range in this ring. Right, and say we have these three locations that represent the, uh, I mean, kind of the range that these three different partitions that it needs to be responsible for, right? And that this would be the uh, end or boundaries of the uh, locations or the range that these different partitions would be responsible for. So every time we have a key that we need to hash, right, try to figure out what which partition it belongs to, it will actually first, again, to hash this value between zero and one, right? No matter how many nodes you have, you always hash this value between zero and one. <laughs> and then you will just round up this decimal value to the closest partition uh, that, um, that like, related uh, that, that to, this, uh, to this value of this hash key, right? In this case, after uh, hash this key one, it lands, I mean, somewhere at the top. And then after you round up this value, I mean, this would be assigned to the partition one, right? Because that's the first partition encounter. And then similarly, assume that you have another key that would be hashed to a, to a different location in this ring, and then you are round up and assigned to partition three. And then how to uh, decide, and then, uh, as you just read here, what this does is that essentially for this uh, blue region, as I draw here, right? If a key up after hashing land to this blue region, then this key would be belong to this uh, first partition, partition one. And similarly, for all the keys that comes or land in this region after hashing, it will be uh, belong to partition two. And similarly, uh, for all the rings, uh, for, the, for all the keys land in this region, it will be belong to uh, partition three, right? So, so far so good, right? Make sense? So what's interesting here is that what if now I want to add a new node, right? <laughs> so before, <laughs> I, I, in, the, in the old scenario where I mod the number of nodes, uh, I mean, after I hash the key, and then I, after I add a new node, everything could change. I have to move everything around. Now, after, a new, after I add a new node, in this consistent hashing scenario, I just uh, I mean, pick a new uh, location in this ring. And typically, you would pick a location that has the largest gap, right? 
And then, but at high level, you just pick a new location for this node. And then what you need to do is that after you assign this location for the node, this node will be responsible for everything before that node, I mean, up, 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 up until, for example, here this P4, P4 will be responsible for everything before and up until P2 in this range, right? So what we need to do is that you only need to move this data, so you only need to go to this uh, node P3, right? Because originally all the data here belongs to P3, right? So you only need to go through P3 and then read every single record and compute their hash value. And then if the new hash value land in the region B2, P2, and P4, then you will just move that data around instead of touching many other nodes and move everything around, right? So in this case, uh, this would actually uh, very localize the movement after you add a new node. And similarly, right, say here, you add a new node, node 5, and then you would just only look at the original data reside on node 1, and then move that portion of data land to the new region, belong to P5, to the new node. And similarly, if you, if you add a node 6 here, you could do it that way, right? So with this uh, consistent hashing, even though you are keep adding node, but you can always look at a region that is like the biggest on the ring and, and trying to move data from the current node that has the potentially the most number of records to the new node and localize the movement that way. Right? That would be actually uh, be much simpler and much more efficient than moving all the data around when you just simply mod the part, uh, number of nodes in your cluster. That makes sense? Okay, nice, nice. So <laughs> One additional uh, uh, problem, if you will, I want to talk a little bit here, is that uh, we'll get to the details uh, in the next class when we talk about uh, concurrency control. But an additional uh, interesting property with this consistent hashing is that in distributed database system world, oftentimes you will actually be uh, replicating your data as well, right? Because, I mean, now you have the luxury of uh, put data on different machines in different data centers, different regions, Oftentimes, right, in most cases, you, users will actually choose to replicate a particular partition of the data <laughs> to uh, several uh, different nodes, so that if one node down, you have the copy of the data immediately available on other nodes, uh, so that you can uh, read that from the other copies as well, right? So in this consistent hashing uh, scenario or algorithm, it's very easy to handle that as well. Say you have, we want to have a replication factor of three, then in this consistent hashing, for example, you, your data land in P1, then, right, for example here, right, if your data land in P1, then uh, uh, besides just looking at the uh, data immediately after the roundup, you can actually copy the data in these three different locations right next to P1, right? It will be uh, P1, P2, P6, and P2. And then you can copy this uh, data with key one to these three different consecutive locations on this ring. And then every, every time the query arrives, you can uh, choose to read this data from one of the copies, okay? So that's what, I mean, if one node goes down, then you can also know, read data from other copies. So this will actually uh, be very convenient to handle that case as well. And here, I actually want to give you guys a heads up about, heads up about a uh, consistency issue that also involved in this uh, replication scenario. We, again, we'll talk about more details later, but then remember, uh, like, like, I think it's like last week or two weeks before, we talk about the acid property, right? We talk about this consistency property. At that, at that, time, at that time, I said that the property of consistency would actually uh, matter a, a bit more in a distributed scenario than a single node scenario, right? So in this case, exactly, I mean, it's like examples of, of, that, of that consistency issue. See here, I have uh, three replications, I mean, that all have the copy of this, this data, right? Then every time, if I want to update this key, right, then I have uh, actually two different choices here, right? The first choice would be that I broadcast this update for all those three different locations, P1, P6, and P, P2, and then I wait until all the three, I mean, partitions to come back and say that, hey, I successfully write this record to my partition. Right? You wait everything finished, and then you come back to the client, right? So tell the client that your, your, your query has committed. Then obviously, this would be uh, very uh, consistent. So actually in uh, consistency terminology, this would be called a strong consistency. But then the, obviously the problem is that before you only need to write one, partition, but now you need to write to a three different partition, and you have to wait everything to finish, right? If there's a straggler, somehow there's a network delay happening on one partition, or the disk has just had a slow write on one partition, then your whole query or transaction will be stalled, 
right? So there could be a limited performance issue. And then another choice will actually be that every time you want to uh, write, uh, let's say, uh, to this uh, key one, you, you, you still can still uh, issue rise to all the three partitions, but then you only respond to your client when the first partition return, right? Say the P1 uh, partition one is very fast, then you just uh, tell your client uh, you have already successfully finished the uh, part, finished this query as long as P1 return, right? Say I have committed. Then, I mean, uh, you are just assuming that at some point this rise to uh, P, P6 and P2 will finish, right? And reflect the correct value. So this would actually be called eventual consistency. It would actually be a much weaker consistency level, as you can imagine, than the strong consistency that I've mentioned in the, in the first example. But then, of course, this is potentially faster, but then this would have the issue of before the rise on P6 and P2 finish, then the value of P2 and P, on P2 and P6 could be outdated, right? So some transactions, if they are reading a value from P1, it would read a new value. If they read a value from P2 and P6, it would be an old value, right? So it's not exactly consistent. So depending on application, right, depending on how fast or, or how strict you, your application requires the transaction semantics is, you may choose either a strong or like eventual consistency, right? Again, we'll talk about uh, concurrency control in distributed scenario later, and just give you a heads up related to uh, this, um, this acid property that I, I mentioned earlier. And, this, uh, and also, this uh, consistency issue is actually not specific to consistent hashing, right? If you use normal hashing, if you, you use a range partitioning, you would also be a deal with uh, this uh, consistency issue as well, all right? So just an example for that. So like I mentioned, uh, this, this, this consistency hashing is actually a very good way to uh, handle a uh, partitioning problem in distributed database. And there are also uh, many uh, systems that are using this. For example, the Amazon DynamoDB, I think is actually the first notable system that uh, used this, and they have a paper on that. And then later on, there's this uh, system called Cassandra, came from Facebook, also used uh, consistency hashing to handle their distributed database. And also uh, there's other uh, newer startups, actually I forgot the name of them, but um, there are also other uh, newer startups also use this, is, uh, this um, approach as well, all right? So uh, we talk about uh, this uh, consistent hashing. Now I want to give you a few examples of this uh, logical and physical partitioning. Like I mentioned earlier, right? You just by partitioning the data doesn't necessarily mean that the data has to be on, the, on different machines, right? Especially in a logical partitioning scenario, which would be uh, very common in the uh, shared uh, nothing, sorry, very common in the shared disk scenario, different nodes could just be responsible for handling the queries of different partition, but all the data could be all in this shared disk space, right? So here, for example, I have a shared disk architecture. See that this shared storage space has four records, one, two, three, four, and because it's like managed, for example, managed by um, Amazon S3 in this uh, shared architecture, I don't really care which machine each of these records is on, right? So what, what I do care is that for different nodes, I mean, they are going to be responsible for different uh, partition of data, right? So here, for example, in node one, it's responsible for one, two, I mean, ID one and two, and then if the application server sends a query to access tuple with ID one, it will be go to a node one, right? And then it will just uh, go to this shared disk space to get this uh, record with the ID one from this uh, unified interface. And similarly, if a node want to get access um, to ID uh, equals to three, it will go to the second node and get access there, right? Again, different nodes, I mean, it would be better for load balancing reason, right? It will also be uh, better for the uh, consistency handle handling when the different nodes are responsible for different specific records. But at the end of the day, everything would go to this shared space, which may or may not put records on the same disk. Make sense? Okay. And then the different example, right, on the country of that would be a physical partitioning, right? That would be more common in the shared nothing scenario where you actually would have, <laughs> you would be directly locating data on the specific disk, right? Local to a specific node, right? So here, for example, the first node can have a high ID one and two, the second node can have ID three and four, right? And in this case, again, similar to, I mean, the early example, if you have a request that want ID equals to one, one tuple with ID equals to one, you go to the first node, and then you have a query or request that want ID equals to three, you will go to the second node. Right. And in this case, you actually go to the specific node and access the record locally I mean, on a local disk I mean, on that machine, right? Which, I mean, again, if a transaction only access that record, would potentially be faster, 
All right. Okay. So that's that. But that's when talk, all the example. Probably one thing you have noticed that in all the examples I showed earlier, all the transactions only access data on a single node, right? And like I mentioned, in that case, maybe a shared a nothing architecture would potentially be better because everything is local, right? But then, but for those kind of transactions, they will be called a single node transaction, right? Essentially, means that all the data a transaction needs to read or a query needs to read will be accessing uh, to a disk locally to that node. Okay, but then in practice, often cases, right, you, it's not that ideal, right? Sometimes you just have to read the data that is not on your specific partition, right? That, that scenario would be called a distributed transaction. And then in that scenario, when a transaction, I mean, a query by itself needs to either would be like one single query or multiple query, it doesn't really matter, right? But when a transaction needs to access data across different partitions or different nodes, in your, in your cluster, then this would actually be a very, very expensive and require expensive coordination, okay? And that's what we are going to uh, talk about next about uh, this uh, coordination of distributed transaction. Again, uh, I mean, hi the high level thing about this is that if all the transactions would be single node, then the distributed database would actually be very easy, right? Because all you need to do is that you partition the data on different machines and figure out which data is on which machine, then you will be done, right? So if you only have a single node transaction, things would be very easy. So what would be challenging with distributed uh, database would exactly be this distributed transaction when you actually need to access uh, data on different machines and lots of coordination needs to happen, all right? Okay. <laughs> so uh, at high level, there would actually uh, be uh, two different approaches to handle these uh, distributed transactions, right? So one would be called a centralized approach. Essentially, you can think of that just a centralized, I mean, similar to the uh, Mongo architecture I mentioned earlier, right? There will be like a central config server handling the, I mean, that have information about location of data. Here, the centralized approach, you have a global, uh, I mean, server or a traffic cop that will actually know the status of all the transactions and which transaction is accessing which data on which node, which transaction locks which, et cetera, and then do all the coordination a lot and uh, resolving all the concurrency control issue, right? And then every time a transaction wants to commit, the centralized uh, node or traffic cop needs to make the decision, right? Then, I mean, kind of obvious, the, Contrary approach will be called a decentralized approach, right? Where different nodes actually just organize themselves. So uh, every node will actually be responsible for coordinating uh, whether a transaction should be committing or not. But at the end of the day, right, even though it's decentralized, one specific node needs to be responsible for a specific transaction that it should commit or not, right? It's just besides a kind of like a heterogeneous um, uh, centralized approach, every node would have the ability to decide uh, which transaction commit or not, right? That would be called decentralized approach, right? So <laughs> the uh, very first uh, centralized approach, example of this, will be something called the TP monitors, actually dates way back to uh, 70s or 90s, right? Uh, th I think at that, at that time it's called a telecom uh, monitor, but nowadays uh, people actually refer to them as a transaction processing monitor. And actually at that time, there's even no like uh, mature implementation of, of distributed database system yet, right? So, but, but maybe there are many uh, use cases that people need the, distribu the functionality of distributed database. So what people do at that time is that many people, for example, for ATMs or airline reservations, right, you have a different machines or different, sorry, different databases uh, that are holding all the records or the tickets, right, airline tickets, but then you have um, different clients want to access them at the same time, you actually have um, sort of a middleware, if you will, right? I mean, sits between that coordinate the uh, execution of these uh, different transactions uh, to uh, different, different database servers, right? Again, for each database server, it has its own concurrency control algorithm, right? To make sure that access to that specific database is acid, right? It's like uh, protected by a concurrency control algorithm, but then, for different clients that may access records to different databases, right, located potentially on different machines, they need to go to this uh, centralized um, transaction processing monitor and to resolve which record is on which, which transaction needs to be locked, and then how to uh, handle all the conflicts correctly, right? So I'll uh, give you a um, example for this, right? Say I have an application server here, right? <laughs> and then when the application server needs to access the data, say it needs to access uh, data on these uh, three different partitions, right? 
you actually need to send this centralized coordinator that, hey, this query needs to access this data on three different partitions uh, on this uh, cluster of databases, right? And then what this coordinator will do is that this coordinator will actually need to log, well, it'll have a log table, and it will need to put log on these uh, three uh, different um, partitions of data, right? And then only after that, this, uh, I mean, it can send back uh, the acknowledgement to the client, and then client can go ahead and modify the content or read and write the content of these three different partitions. And in the meantime, depending on whether you are holding read log or write log, other uh, transactions may not be able to access data on these different partitions. Again, this is like a in neural system, right? If you do this inside the distributed database system, it could be finer grain at the table level, table level, et cetera. But then back into the old days, right, with this centralized controller, it will be at partition level. You have to log the whole thing, right? And then you can, yeah, you can access all these different records. So now, see that this transaction or the application finished this query and then wants to commit, right? So what you need to do? It actually needs to go to every single of these, um, these like uh, machines or partitions, right? To ask the machine, hey, have you finished all your operation? Have you finished all the writes? Am I ready to commit right now, right? And if every transaction was ready to commit, then it comes back to this uh, coordinator, sends the acknowledgement and saying that, hey, I can safely commit and then I can now release all the logs uh, in my log table, right? That's how to handle that, uh, this like uh, in the first implementation, very only original idea. And then actually there are uh, systems uh, still be using something similar to that, right? There's actually one a startup called Transac uh, that actually came from CMU, right? Build uh, some sort of a, a transaction monitor in this fashion, and actually again came out came out very early, but still be used in, in many systems, right? And then Oracle also has a uh, version of this. Oracle is also Oracle has been doing database database business for a long time, right? He also has a version of this called Taxido, and there are also this other um, company called Omit that is like doing this kind of service, right? But then this are kind of like an early implementation of these uh, distributed transactions. <laughs> and then what happened a little bit later is that instead of just a, a simple coordinator, we are, because in the coordinator, like I mentioned this early, like I uh, mentioned this early, this application server actually need to send a log request to the coordinator to log different partitions, right? And then when the uh, log finishes, the application server needs to send other like individual requests to the partitions, right? To get all the data back, right? This is like a, this very limited, uh, I mean, or there could still be a loss of involvement with the application server as well, right? So a later optimization or extension of this approach is that you actually build a middleware that would hide all those logics, right? So this would actually be used more common in many of the neural systems as well, right? So essentially, in this case, when the application server sends the request to a, to a I mean, distributed database, it doesn't need to know uh, which data is, is on which machine, it doesn't send log requests, and then it doesn't send individual requests to different uh, server or partitions either, right? It just sends a single request just as a single node database, and then inside this middleware, it actually maintains all the information of which data is on which partition, etc. And also, this middleware is gonna be responsible to send log requests or maintain log, log requests on different partitions, right? And say in this case, again, it needs to lock these three different partitions, and then this middleware will put this lock in this lock table. But then there's nothing that this application server needs to do anymore, right? The, log, the middleware hides all the details. And after that, the middleware will uh, do all the read and update on the application's behalf, right? And then after that, when the application sends the commit request, similarly, the middleware will ask, hey, whether each of these partition would be safe to commit, and if yes, it comes back and then commit the transaction. Right. So this will be kind of like an optimized version right, of the original transaction processing monitor approach that would hide many of the details. And this actually, this approach will be more common, right? used in many of the neural systems. The biggest example of this is like Facebook's actually have the largest MySQL cluster on the world that they manage using this approach. So each MySQL would actually be just be a normal single node database system we talked about earlier in this class, but then they build this uh, uh, like a function, like a complex middleware that would hide all the details for their uh, MySQL cluster, right? That's actually the largest thing in the world. And then YouTube also has a version of this, also built on MySQL, called uh, Vertice, right? That's uh, also, I mean, use this middleware approach. 
And then also uh, Google also do it, at least Google used to have a version of MySQL service also use this approach as well. All right, make sense? Cool. So <laughs> the uh, next approach would be, uh, I mean, as I usually hear, would be a decentralized coordinator, right? So that would be uh, each uh, node would, would have the ability to commit a transaction. So again, like the symbol illustrated here, when a application server sends a, a begin request, it will actually find a, a master node for that specific transaction. In this case, it could be P1, right? But it also could be P3 and P4, depending on your load balancing, right? depending on your routing mechanism, et cetera. But it just pick one master node, right? And then this master node will be responsible for all the coordinations of this specific transaction, right? And then, of course, this transaction can pick, can have user requests to other nodes, uh, P4, P3, et cetera. But then this master node would be responsible for recording all those information, which, um, which partitions this transaction accessed, and then whether it's conflicting with others or not. And then when the transaction wants to commit, this master node would similarly, right, issuing this request, whether safe to commit, et cetera, and then get back to the, uh, to the client server. But then, just in this case, every node in the cluster would have the ability to handle and commit transactions. And of course, you also need to, to, co to do coordination between different nodes now as well, right? Because when every node can commit, then, I mean, things can conflict and you have to do coordination, which I'll get to get to next class, all right? So I would just, uh, I would have uh, like a two or three more slides to give you just a little bit small heads up about the uh, distributed concurrency control that we are, we are going to talk about next class, right? So uh, at high level, right, when we are trying to uh, control the concurrency of distributed transaction, many of the ideas right, we used when we talk about single node transaction will actually be still be, up, be able to apply, right? Either timestamp ordering concurrency control, two-phase locking, et cetera, we will actually be applying many of the uh, similar mechanisms. But instead, which is but beyond what those uh, mechanism, what we need to do here is that we need some additional steps, right? To handle the case where, hey, there's the data on a different machine, you may put in, need to put a lock on a different machine, and then sometimes after you acquire a lock on that machine, that machine go down, what you need to do when the node comes back, as well as what if like, there are different skills uh, on the, there are skills on the different locks on different machines, for example, if you're using a timestamp ordering concurrency control, right? Again, two-phase locking, uh, optimistic concurrency control, all those things would still apply, it's just there are additional steps and additional scenarios that we need to uh, handle in a distributed scenario, right? <laughs> in a simple example here, right? Like just like, I think this is the last example in this class. Say I have just two applications, right? Oh, sorry, two application servers, right? And then we have two nodes, and then connect by the network. Say this, like one application wants to read record A on this first node. The other application wants to read record B on the second node. So far, so good, right? And they, they can lock the corresponding node or lock the specific record on the corresponding node. But now, what if that uh, we, we encounter a common like a deadlock scenario, right? Say. The first application needs to read uh, B, the second application needs to read A, right? Then, I mean, we have a deadlock, we know how to resolve that in a, in a single node scenario, right? Essentially, we are going to construct this wait for graph and then break things up, right? I mean, it seems easy, but then in a distributed scenario, right, C scenario, we need to consider things like, hey, these different locks may own different machines, right? Then how do we coordinate the different locks? And then also, there's maybe network delay on these different machines, right? So network communication may be costly. We don't want to send that messages and back and forth very frequently. And lastly, uh, when one node go down, we also need to handle that, hey, how do we maintain the information and handle it correctly, right? So we are going to more about those uh, details next class. So in conclusion, right? So as you can, I, I, I was, I've been alluded many times, the distributed, distributed database system, especially when you have a distributed transactions, that's very, very difficult. And in this class, we pretty much only scratch the surface, right? Talk about the uh, high level concepts. We are going to talk about more details in the next class and the next, next class. But then again, I mean, this distributed transaction or distributed database could very well be its own semester, semester long class. So in this class, we are going to focus on the high level concepts. And then next class, we're going to talk more about the distributed concurrency control, and we're going to talk about the replication cap theorem and give you some more real-world examples as well. All right, thanks for that, and looking forward to see you guys on Wednesday. Yeah.
Talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Bus is mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. Need for a mic check, bust it. The fuse all set, then grab a 40. The flim the yoga snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the dump. 